Helping you achieve fantastic success in the entertainment industry is what Robin Lang is all about. An expert in many facets of entertainment, he appears on news the world over. Over a dozen of those he represented are world-famous household names today. Successful himself as an entertainer, agent, talent broker, promoter, and producer, Robin helps navigate you to take advantage of the top business opportunities available today in live entertainment, next on Revenue Chat. Hi everyone, this is Tony Tierso with Revenue Chat. With us we have Robin Lang, entertainer, agent, talent broker, promoter, and producer. He's been there, done that, and teaches others to do the same. Successful as a disc jockey, master of ceremonies, comedian, TV personality, game show host, and stage hypnotist, he's fully established in the entertainment industry and runs a full-service agency promoting and producing events nationwide. He worked with and represented many well-known acts, works, and artists with top names such as George Burns, Steve Allen, Phyllis Diller, Tony Bennett, Tom Jones, Kenny Rogers, Wooly Nelson, The Beach Boys, The Monkees, Loretta Lynn, Michael Jordan, Don Rickles, and the list goes on. Robin says there are excellent opportunities in live entertainment where you can earn $100 to $500 per hour with no experience or special talents necessary and is going to tell us all about it. His website is entertainmentopportunities.com. All right, get ready for Robin to show us how to easily get into the show business. Let's bring him on. Hello, Robin. How are you? Very good, Tony. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Thank you. And I'm very grateful to have you on the show. I really like what you're all about. And I want to tell you that it's very appreciated for you to take some time to hang out with us on Revenue Chat. Well, I'm very excited. And, uh, you know, I love talking with uh, entrepreneurs and other like-minded people. And, you know, I think we can all learn so much from each other. So uh, I'm just as excited to be here. Well, good. We have a lot of entrepreneurs, startups, and small businesses in our audience. And this is a very interesting title here where we're going to be talking about basically the top business opportunities in live entertainment. I'm very excited. I hope everybody else is. And perhaps just before we start, I did mention a little bit about you, and I'd like to know more about your roots and how you became an expert in this field. Robin, can you tell us how did it all start for you? You know, I've been telling people this story for years, and I, you would think by now I'd have a quick way of doing this, but uh, it, there's so many different elements to it that uh, uh, it's hard to really kind of understand unless I start at the beginning. And uh, the beginning for me was back when I was uh, probably about 12 years old. I was, this is, this is in the era, just to, to paint the picture, of the late 60s and into the early 70s when in uh, music, family groups were quite popular. You had the Beach Boys and you had the, you know, the Carpenters and the Osmonds and the Jackson 5 and the Cow Sills. And uh, I was in a family band and that's how it all started. You know, it was my uh, family and parents kind of, you know, booked us and managed us and we were the talent and Ah, that was just the thing at the time. And I was a guitar player and and really got into it. It was all family for a while. And then like other groups, certain people are into it more than the others. So then we started getting outsiders that came into the group. And at about that same time, my parents had less and less to do with us. And uh, what's, what's really kind of funny about it is very quickly we had to be, I had to become, or we, we found ourselves in a situation where we had to focus on being both the talent as well as kind of the behind the scenes, the, the booking, the operations of running a family group. And a lot of people don't think about it, but uh, I'm a firm believer when it comes to entertainment, there's two parts to it. They call it show business. There's the show part, which is the performance and the thing that a lot of us get into it for. And then there's the business part, which you know, that's where the success is created. There's so much great talent out there just performing in their bedroom, in their bathroom, or in front of the mirror holding a brush as a microphone because they don't have the business aspect of things behind them. So um, the band worked, went on for a while and worked out real well. And as we started, uh, by this point, I'm 17 or 18, and I took over kind of booking the band and managing the band ourselves. And we had a couple of managers in there, but nobody seemed to quite understand or share our vision as much as we did. And 
you know, when our parents were involved, they always have your best interests in mind. But uh, other people didn't always share the same uh, perspectives on things. So I started doing it. And real early on, I, I should preface this by saying I was always an entertainment junkie. I loved watching uh, performers like on Ed Sullivan or Johnny Carson. Uh, my parents would let me stay up late and watch it. And, and I was always equally fascinated or just uh, intrigued with when people would talk about managers and agents and stuff like that, and you would get guys like on Johnny Carson that would talk about my aunt, my manager, my booking agent, my agent, this, and you know Johnny himself would talk about his attorney slash agent, and I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world is is kind of getting every nugget I could behind the scenes of business. And then when it came time to book our own group, I had a thought, and, and, and what's really funny is I had this thought at 12 years old. And it came back to me about 17, and it's like, you know what, if, if we're doing all of this work to market and promote our group, why don't we market and promote several others at the same time? You know, if we're sending out promotional information on just ourselves, we could put two or three other people in there as well. And that's kind of what got me off into uh, starting an entertainment agency. And in my town that I'm from, uh, from Aurora, Illinois, which uh, people may know from Wayne's World. That was the, the town that Wayne's World, the movie, was set in. But um, I had a full-service entertainment agency that if you wanted any kind of entertainment, that's what we were there for. We had a roster of, geez, if you needed a, a band for a wedding, if you needed a clown or a magician for a kid's party or a juggler, if you needed... Oh my goodness, a hypnotist, if you needed uh, whatever, if you needed a, a three piece accordion band, <laughs> we either had it or uh, we had a date, you know, we'd keep the people uh, on file. And, and we started becoming known for being the go to people if you needed entertainment. You, and other acts liked working with us because as an agency, being artists ourselves and performers, we always kind of try to operate from the artist perspective as well as the agencies and the, the clients which a lot of agents don't have. They don't have that performer's aspect to them. So I think we could uh, relate to them more. And that's how it all started. Uh, as things went on, I got tired of being in the band only because, only for the simple reason that we seemed to spend more time training new people than we did playing. We'd play for six or eight months out of the year, and then a drummer would quit. And then we'd have to replace the drummer. We'd spend three or four months training and breaking in a new drummer, and the bass player would quit. And I was just tired of other people preventing me from making my living. And uh, so I decided I wanted to be a solo performer. My brother that stuck with me through all of it went in the military. So it was kind of my time to think of myself. And I started doing more on the booking end, and I became a solo performer. I, uh, created a game show that tours nationally. I became a hypnotist and mentalist and things that I could do more myself. And that's kind of where it, it started. And then, of course, from there, there are different things that uh, I was very fortunate enough to uh, have some great mentors that took this journey down several other paths. That is so cool, Robin. I especially like the part about the family band. That is so cool. I remember back in, what is it now, the 70s where all the family bands started rising. And yeah. that's very cool. Very cool indeed. I can see how you've gone from working in the industry to working for the industry, so to speak. And by the way, just as a little side, the music that you hear on the intro and extra of my radio show, I wrote, created, and orchestrated, and it's just uh, instrumental, but that when you hear it, that's my music. Oh, fantastic. I I've written a bunch of songs. Uh, I haven't done anything with it. I didn't have anyone like you. <laughs> 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 but I never considered, really, truly, never considered myself a performer or entertainer. I just like music for the sake of the art of it. But anyway. That's a good creative outlet, too. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, hopefully you like my song and other people, you know, when they hear it, they like, you did that? I go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It gives them a new appreciation. You know, first of all, it's like, what's this Hawaiian music? Then I say, you know, I wrote that. They go like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> There's like four guitars in there and some drums and a piano. But anyways, back to you. Uh, this is really interesting. So here you now, and that makes great sense. So you are now booking yourself, using that information, booking yourself, going on. And you mentioned something about a mentor. Like who showed you all these ropes? Well, what was very funny, and so much of this has come full circle. Now, like I, we mentioned the family groups, 
one of the family groups that, uh, of course, was popular, at least on TV in the 70s, was the Partridge family. And a lot of people may not realize it, but the Partridge family was actually based on a group in the 60s uh, from Rhode Island called the Cow Sills. And they did uh, hair, the song Hair, Give Me I a remember. Head with Hair, you know, and oh, yes. uh, the Rain the Park and other things in Indian Lake. And they had a string of hits in the late 60s. And they actually offered, the producers offered them to be on the show, but... Uh, they were only interested in the mother. They didn't want the kids. They didn't, you know, they didn't fit the images they had in their mind. So they went on to cast what became the Partridge family. And, and uh, you know, back when I was a kid, I was into TV. And like I said, I watched these, these shows and, you know, and all the shows of the day. The monkeys were very big and Batman was big. And what's very odd and strange and so cool in many ways is my career went on uh, I became friends and started working with a lot of these people. And a lot of them ultimately became my mentors. I, I did it. One of the things that happened was I got married and had a daughter. And this was in, in early 1980, uh, 80, 81, 82. And my brother had gone into the military and I just didn't want to be on the road traveling uh, as much as I had been. And so that's when I kind of decided to do more solo things. And one of the things I did kind of a, a love of mine on the side. I never pursued it, but I was fascinated with it. It was radio. And I grew up in the Chicago land where we had, uh, you know, we were a major market, much like New York, LA. And we, you know, back in those days, it wasn't iPod radio or jukebox radio where it was all about songs and mixes. The, the DJs, the on-air personalities were just as famous as a lot of celebrities. They were well-known. They had great followings and they were entertainment on, on the radio. So one of the first things I did when uh, I got married is it's like, okay, I don't want to go on the road. So I'm going to go uh, look into being on the air. And uh, I got into radio and instantly I decided that I, I wanted to kind of cover the celebrity scene. And luckily enough, I think people just tended, they, 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 they tend to like me and I would do celebrity interviews and, you know, we were a major market. So all kinds of celebrities went through Chicago and it was a celebrity talk show called The Celebrity Spotlight. It started on radio and eventually went to TV. And I would interview these celebrities. And, of course, we would talk about the things that they wanted to promote in their latest project, which is why they were on in the first place and agreed to do the show. But then I noticed that I, I just tend to, again, going back to my fascination about the business and the behind-the-scenes things, I'd ask them questions about that. And a lot of them were kind of uh, looking at me as refreshing. I didn't ask the same typical questions that they always got day in, day out, interview after interview. So they'd open up to me. And I don't know what it was, but a lot of them took me under their wing. You know, George Burns and Steve Allen would tell me about old time, uh, you know, playing in the Catskills and vaudeville and, and all of these, uh, you know, how all of the great theaters, if you look at this country, were all based around the railroad, you know, uh, Peoria, Milwaukee, Chicago, Cleveland, you know, all of these were rail routes, and that's how everybody used to travel. So all these great theaters in, in the vaudeville area were built around the rails. And uh, they talked to me about agents and managers and, you know, some guys that uh, were out to take advantage of them, and there's always some shady characters in there. And, oh, my gosh, this was, this was better than going to the movies for me. And so all of them started contributing to being mentors of mine, whether they realized it or not. And throughout all of this, I was very keen to always be aware of opportunities and be on the lookout for them and try to be ready and prepared when they happen. And uh, I started getting known because my band quit playing. I was starting to get known more for the radio show and the, the uh, entertainment agency. So I would tell all these people that would be on my radio shows that I also owned a, a, a local entertainment agency. And, you know, I thought they were just being polite. It's like, oh, well, if you could ever use me for a personal appearance or something, keep me in mind. And we'd exchange phone numbers. And I was on the air one day and a local Kmart was having a grand opening uh, just next door to my hometown. And I think they had Loretta Lynn scheduled to perform or uh, to appear. And she had laryngitis. Something came up where they... On Thursday, this was supposed to be on Saturday, the uh, the grand opening. On Thursday, I get this call saying, we don't have anybody. We don't know what to do. You own the local agency. You uh, know some celebrities from your radio show. Can you help us out? And through that, I got into celebrity booking. It was the strangest thing. This was uh, 
Oh, my goodness. This was the early 80s, 82, I believe it was, 81, 82. And the, we were in a transition as far as media in America. The VCR had just come out in 79. And by 81, 82, 83, prices started getting reasonable, so us average folk could consider getting one. Because when they came out, they were big, bulky, and insanely expensive. And the network started realizing that people were videotaping programs and watching them later. People that worked would watch them in the evenings. Uh, they taped daytime programming and watch it in the evenings. And then in the summer, ABC made a move that uh, was a very important part of my career in the sense that they decided to take their, their daytime soap operas, which had traditionally been for housewives and maybe old ladies. I know my grandma used to watch them. And they decided to put some young characters in there and try to get a younger audience, either the college kids that were off for the summer or the Nielsen company that did ratings did their first VCR ratings to see which programs were most recorded. And a lot of them were these daytime dramas. So they started uh, General Hospital had Luke and Laura as their young couple. And all my children had Greg and Jenny. And when this came out, I'd have them on my radio show, you know, and I talk about all of the the latest happenings, and it was just soap operas were in the in that time were kind of popular, like reality TV show is now, you know, or or as game shows were when they popped in the '60s. So Kmart calls me up and says we need somebody, and I said, well, I just had a couple of people from all my children, and let me call them and see if they'd be willing to come out, and they did. And long story short, uh, I treated them, you know, like celebrities. We had you know limousine uh, chauffeuring us around, and. You know, the, up to this point, soap opera stars had only been in the studio. They, they go in, they'd film their work and go home. And I got these guys out. They were the younger uh, couple on the show. And hundreds, maybe over a thousand of people showed up to this Kmart to see them. More than I had expected, more than Kmart had expected, and more than these celebrities had even imagined. And it was the first time that these guys got a realization that, wow, maybe we are more popular than we've, you know, in the studio, we don't get fans or any of that. And now this is our first dose of, of seeing it. And so they went back to the studio uh, on Monday morning and told all their castmates that they went to Chicago. They met this super agent named <laughs> Robin Lang that booked them on this personal appearance and Hundreds of people showed up, and it was the coolest thing they'd ever done. They signed autographs for a couple of hours and posed for pictures, and everybody was so nice. And by later on that day and the next day, they called me and they said, you know, I shared our weekend adventure with some people on the set, and they're kind of interested in that too. Would you mind if I give them your phone number? And I said, sure. And they called, and by like 5 o'clock the next day, I had a roster of 50 or 55 celebrities that I was booking from these daytime soap operas. And you got to remember back in the early 80s, some unknowns that are well known now started out on soaps. You had uh, John Stamos, who was on uh, General Hospital as Blackie Parrish. At, and on the same show was Demi Moore and Rick Springfield. And all of these guys went on to, to you know, become major celebrities. So I was the, one of the guys, one of the three of us throughout America that started booking soap opera stars on personal appearances, and that got me into kind of the celebrity world, and all of these people contributed to being mentors of mine. Wow, what a cool story, Robin. What an exciting life you lived back there. Very cool. By the way, I grew up in Chicago, and I know very much what you mean about a lot of this. Hardly a day went by that I did not listen to the radio. It was just the way of life out there. Radio was very, very big because one of the th reasons it was portable and you could take it everywhere. It, it was. And it was, it was you know, I, now looking back, I, I, you know, I'm friends with Dick Biondi and Larry Lujak and uh, from Chicago, and they were major stars in our market. And they were really uh, like a thread of our, our, our youth. You know, they, they were a big part of growing up for us. Very cool. Well, let's move on. Let's talk about this because you mentioned the new American dream. So let me find out what do you mean by that, please? Well, you know, times have changed. And one of the things that I've, I've done and I've been very fortunate in this industry is like the soap opera star appearances. When we started uh, after those first uh, grand opening appearances, we started doing all the Kmart grand openings, started touring malls, shopping malls became big in the 80s. And you know, we would do personal appearances at malls and colleges and oh my gosh. And 
Uh, like I said, we kind of pioneered that. There were a couple other people uh, throughout the country that were doing it as well. We weren't all connected by the internet like we are now. It was a different time. But um, the era we grew up in, you know, our parents, kind of the, the game plan was to get your education and then to, to get a good job, to get in with the company. And uh, a lot of people had two or three jobs before, before they found that right job or that right company. And then they would kind of commit to that. That was, you know, they'd spend 20, 30, 40 years there. And if all went well, you'd retire from this company. They'd take care of you and uh, you got in good. And, and then when you retired, you were kind of set for retirement. And that was, you know, that was the 50s. That was the 60s. And that's the way it was. And like it or not, good or bad, better or worse, the, the times have changed a little bit. You know, longevity companies are have downsized. We went through the, the downsizing. We went out, through, uh, went through the uh, the buyouts and the mergers and and it's just not the same landscape that it used to be. You know, the, it used to be get it, get your education, get in with a good job and a good company that you could stay with and, and commit to, buy a nice house with a white picket fence and a car in the driveway and a, have a great wife and a two, three, four kids. And that's, that was the American dream. You know, there was nothing wrong with that. Women wanted to grow up uh, to be homemakers and housewives. Guys were happy to go to work, and when they came home, uh, the wife had dinner on the, uh, on the table, and families would be together in the evening till bedtime and help out with homework, and that was, that, was, that was the way it was. Well, now things have changed. You know, everybody's working. Everybody's, uh, it's very difficult to survive on just one income like it might have been in, in previous generations, and I think because of that, uh, the way we approach things, things have changed. The way that we execute things has changed, and... What satisfies us now has changed. And I think one of the, the things that I refer to the old American dream of the, the great job, the house, the family, and the white picket fence is kind of being replaced with these companies aren't taking care of me. If I get a job with somebody, I don't know that it's going to last forever. If my parents worked 45 years for a company, I don't know that that would happen with this company. I don't know that I would want to be with this company 45 years. Things are more mechanical now, more technology less personal. Uh, I remember my grandfather giving me a story that uh, once that he wanted to buy a house and he didn't have the money and his boss loaned him the money just here. You know, here's the money, go out and, and get the house. And it's just, it's not like that anymore. So we've had to adapt. And I think uh, homes need two incomes uh, or somebody working a job and a half or two jobs. And I think one of the things that people strive for now is having control whether that means being in charge of your earnings, being in charge of what you do. I can go to work and work 40 or 50 hours a week for someone else, or I can, I can do it for myself and be in control of when I work, how I work, uh, how much I make, rather than doing all this work and the majority of the money going to the company or, or, or the man, so to speak. Uh, I can do things and have uh, all of the money go to me, you know, and uh, people are thinking that way more. And I think now the American dream is is uh, having that control and, and being uh, having either a part-time job or being self-employed where you can call more of the shots and you feel that you're getting more for your efforts. Okay, gotcha. So yes, that very much is a new American dream. More and more entrepreneurs and small businesses are springing up all over the place. It's a way of life. Absolutely agreed. Now, among that, you say that entertainment careers are among some of the, shall I say, best business opportunities available in America today. Why is that, please? Well, you know, here's the thing. Most people, when they think of entertainment, they think of it in a recreational kind of way. Oh, this is what we do at night or on the weekends or when we're on vacation or, oh, I've been working hard all week. I think I'll go out and get a drink or maybe uh, go hear some live music or go dance at a dance club or Oh, little Johnny's turning five years old. We want to have a birthday party. Let's get a magician or let's get a bounce house or something like that. They think of entertainment relative to their recreation. They don't necessarily think of it as a business opportunity or a job or a career. And it's not that we are unaware of it. We just don't tend to think of it. Uh, and I, you, let's go back to one of those examples. Let's, let's think about the kid's uh, birthday party uh, where they hire a magician in a bounce house for a couple of hours uh, on a Saturday afternoon for a kid's party. That magician is, is a talented, skilled uh, professional. And although he may only be there for an hour or 75 minutes or an hour and a half, you know, he's probably making $250, $300, you know, somewhere in there. 
And the bounce house is probably charging $250, $300 for a couple hours for that as well. And you don't think about it, but uh, a lot of these magicians, for example, kids uh, and family entertainers, they'll work three, four, and five parties on a Saturday or two or three on a Sunday, maybe a couple of weeknights here or there, or you might see them at a restaurant or something. And when you stop and break it down, it's like, okay, I guess I have seen a, a magician at a kid's party or in a restaurant, but it never dawned on me that that guy's making $300 for two hours. That's 150 bucks an hour. And you say he's got four gigs that day. <laughs> you know, when you think about it, it's like, wow, he, he's making some uh, seriously good part-time money, you know, or maybe he's full-time. But, uh, you know, and when you think about it, it's like, okay, if, if each show is an hour and a half or two and he's got four of them that day, he's working an eight-hour day. Most people, and if, and if he's making $300 at every one, that's 1200 bucks for the day. Most people don't make that in a day. You know, most people don't make that in a week. So it, it's really, when you put it in the right perspective, I think we all are aware that it's there, but we don't think of it as an opportunity. And that's just one or two of them. You know, when you think of a DJ at a wedding, you know, uh, these DJs make anywhere from five, six, seven to $1,500 to do a wedding reception. And, uh, they, you know, they, during the week, they might do nightclubs or they might do school dances or whatever else there is, you know, and uh, in the summer, they'll do fairs and festivals and, of course, holiday company parties at Christmas time. And they don't stop and think that, geez, these people are making 250 an hour, you know, and, and uh, they're doing quite well. So there's in my uh, entertainment career and business opportunities directory, I have taken 40 different live entertainment opportunities. And one of the misconceptions, and I should say this right up front, when I talk about entertainment business opportunities, it's, it does not mean that you have to be the entertainer. You know, for a lot of people like myself, I, I was, and it worked out real, real well. But there are other people that would never get on stage with a microphone, could never talk in front of people, and would be petrified to even be in front of people, let alone entertain or, or, you know, play an instrument or tell jokes or anything like that. But there are plenty of people like that that own an entertainment company or service that, that book other entertainers, and uh, they just do the operations. And in, in the book itself, there's six sections. You know, we, we break it down into variety entertainers, things like magicians, comedians, stage hypnotists, uh, game, uh, uh, game show hosts, master of ceremonies, guest speaker. Then we have musical entertainers, which can be your bands or DJs, karaoke or disc jockeys, or maybe a two or three piece combo, or just an acoustic person uh, that plays and sings. Then we get into kids and family entertainment. And oh my gosh, there's everything from face painting and storytellers to kids party hosts, magicians, the, the inflatable bounce houses, carnival games, arts and craft parties, and then we get into novelty, things like clowns and jugglers and all of that. And then there's a whole section for different adult opportunities, which uh, can be modeling, can be dancing, things like that. And then uh, section six is about non-performer type things where you can own a party planning company, be a consultant or an entertainment agency, uh, or be a promoter or a producer. And uh, all of these different opportunities we kind of profile and cover in the directory where you can read them, a little background, a little history, uh, learn a little bit about the opportunity, and you can make notes and compare. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of companies or, or people will try two of them at one time. They, they, a lot of DJ companies also offer karaoke. Those two work well together. And that's what this is. is it, I've kind of taken 40 different live entertainment opportunities and broken them down, profiled them, and uh, put them in the right perspective where you can see them as business opportunities. And one of the great things is almost every one of these can be run from home. If you have the talent or are interested in, in learning a talent, great, but you don't have to be the talent. You can just be the, uh, the owner operator and they have, you know, much uh, higher than average earning potential. And, you know, where else can you go to work or go to a career or a job where people are smiling, they're having a good time and they applaud for you as you're doing your job. <laughs> It's very cool, Robin. And I have a couple of questions I want to ask you about this in directory. It's very intriguing. But first here, this is entertainment. Now, this is not like something very needed yet. You say that it's almost recession proof. Could you tell us why you feel that this is here to stay and grow? Well, it's, it's uh, one of the great things is America, while we might have outsourced a lot of things, Taiwan and China and 
in Japan as far as manufacturing or electronics go. The one thing that we have always been a leader in is our entertainment. You know, Hollywood, TV, movies, uh, radio has been very, you know, very strong in America. Uh, people worldwide have always looked up to us for our arts, Broadway and theater. And other places have, a, you know, great, uh, you know, London is the West End. And, and of course, there's a lot of uh, movies made throughout the world. But we are kind of known for that. And, and I think this is kind of, it's been around forever. So I, I don't see any of it going away. But what, one of the things that makes it so interesting and appealing are we have so many different performance markets where entertainment can exist. You know, we, we've all been, like I say, retirement parties, weddings, anniversaries, and private kind of events. You've got community events, fairs and festivals and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, summer events. You've got corporate events from trade shows and company parties and holiday events, um, there's just so many different things. There's cruise ships, there's resorts, there's um, uh, so the school and education market that a lot of these nightclubs, of course, and well, a lot of these, not everybody may have entertainment at a kid's birthday party. Usually some of them they do. Maybe the fifth one, maybe a sweet 16. That's a, a big one. Uh, and there's, there's certain times that we do certain uh, life celebrations, you know, weddings and uh, whatnot graduation parties, things like that uh, are, are great for entertainment. But there are some venues that rely on entertainment uh, for their existence. You know, nightclubs, uh, comedy clubs, cruise ships, sports centers. You know, a lot of bowling alleys now are, are doing the Rock and Bowl, the Cosmic Bowl, and things like that. So there's a lot of markets that will never dry up completely. They will always... Uh, exist and, and rely and need entertainment. And I think uh, what most entertainers do is you kind of pick certain markets you want to specialize in. But uh, even when the economy is tight and people don't go on vacations or don't travel, more and more c cities and municipalities kick up their, their fairs and festivals in the summer because people are staying closer to home and they want to offer something uh, for their community. So it's very rare that everything would just dry up. There's always markets that are going to need and rely on entertainment. And then, of course, there's other ones that... Uh, you know, can you imagine going to a wedding reception without entertainment? I mean, there's some smaller ones that you do, but uh, there's they, they're so integrated and staples of so many of these markets that uh, they've been around. They have uh, never gone away and more and more just keep opening up. You're right, Robin. I think the last thing that's going to go in our society, no matter how down it may go, and that would be entertainment. People still like to take a break. There's still functions, weddings and so many special events, as you say. People need want to celebrate that, and they'll do anything to scrounge the money and whatever they need to make that happen. They'll still celebrate. So, yes. All right. So now let's see. We've established that, okay, this could be done in any city and in anywhere in the world, and you don't have to be an entertainer because you can book these events, which are very prolific. Now, how would somebody get into this if they're, let's see, Robin, they're working a job. They're doing whatever. Is there a way that someone get into this, and how would that work if they wanted to just try it out or do yeah. it part time? Well, yeah, I think that's the key right there. Is I always advise one of the things that has worked. Uh, you know, this whole ride for me has evolved. You know, I started as an entertainer, then I got into the agency, and, and while well, still being an entertainer, I ended up being a single father from very early on, and I needed to do something that I could be a single parent and still maintain my business and, and my my art. And um, as things went on, back then when I was interested in all this, I realized there was nothing available for this. There, there, there might have been a book on how to be a magician or how to, you know, how to juggle or something, but they weren't career things. They were more about the, the talent or the ability itself. And that's why when I would go to these these different celebrities that became my mentors, they would open up to me and they'd say, you're right, there is nothing out there. Somebody needs to write a book on this stuff. And as my career has gone on, uh, now what I do is, is I, what I do is kind of threefold. I, I still have my agencies. I still uh, perform. But I, I teach, educate, and let inform people about, you know, the careers, jobs, and opportunities in entertainment. I work with corporate clients, churches, charities, uh, in different venues that want to learn how to utilize entertainment for business profit or fundraising. And I also work with and train entertainers. While they might be very good at entertaining, a lot of times they're not good on the business side of things. Once they get into being an entertainer, you realize how important and significant that is. So that's what I do. 
And one of the things I, I teach people is the best way to do it is to start part time, like you just mentioned, at, right in your home area. You know, it's not the kind of thing where you have to move up and head to Hollywood or New York or Broadway or anything like that. Um, entertainment happens every day in, in every market, in every town, not just in America, worldwide. There's, there's, uh, everybody's within entertainment of some sort. And what I always say is, is you know, start locally, uh, kind of become uh, established or known. And, and you, you know, you can be a full service uh, company that books everything, or you can just be specialized in one thing. I uh, have a client that I've been working with that is a clown. And he, when you get into clowning, you realize there's many different kinds of clowns. There's white face clowns. There's pale face clowns, uh, 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 skin tone clowns. There are clowns that juggle. There are clowns that do magic. There are physical. And he was one kind of clown, but realized that there were needs for others. So he started clowning company. In the 80s, disc jockeys became very popular. They actually replaced bands at a lot of events and venues because they had a much wider selection of music and they were much more affordable than paying a five, three, four, five, six piece band. So there are companies that just might have just a disc jockey company or be just a magician, you know, and that's what I, 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 uh, I talk about in the, the directory is all these different opportunities and to start locally and get established, get, uh, get some, some things going. One of the, the things about entertainment opportunities, there's a lot of room for uh, growth. In other words, you could start just like I did as uh, one entertainer and then start booking others. Uh, you could start uh, when the band was going on. One of the things I did briefly, and I could have done more, is I also became a, a duo, acoustic duo. I have a partner, and we did things when the band couldn't play. We'd go out and book ourselves in smaller venues and, and do acoustic things. But you can add more acts. You can add more markets. And then eventually you can go from locally to regionally. Uh, growing up in Chicago, we played Chicagoland. And then eventually we went up to Kenosha and Milwaukee and over to Indiana and Merrillville and, you know, into Iowa and then central Illinois. And then luckily when, <laughs> when I got on, uh, after being on the Oprah Winfrey show, I was worldwide. You know, I mean, we went to so many different countries and uh, it, it just, there's, there's so much to it. So I say start locally, start you know, just yourself or part-time, whatever you decide what you want to do, make some initial foundational decisions and then start locally. And then uh, you can always grow wider, bigger and, and offer more services. Wow. Very cool. And everyone, the book is available and more information on that at the site entertainmentopportunities.com. And now, Robin, let's say someone isn't quite sure and they like the idea, they believe they can do it, they can do it part-time. Do you offer any kind of, well, I have not read the book, so forgive me. So does the book walk them through it or do you offer some kind of mentorship or how can somebody go from where they are to the next step, please? Well, the, all of the above. I, uh, I, this part of my career now, I'm doing a lot of uh, training and coaching and consulting. And um, the, the book highlights the 40 different opportunities and kind of gives an overview and then I had some people come to me and say, this is great. You, you've, I see the potential here. What do I do next? <laughs> you know, so I got much better um, feedback in, in response than I realized. A lot of people see the, the potential. And um, one of the things is most of these opportunities have extremely low startup costs compared to other business ventures. And you can work out of the, you know, they can be home-based and work out of the home or work on your own schedule. And so what I did is I've got info reports, which are much more detailed education on all 40 opportunities that are also available. And I don't expect anybody to go out and buy all 40 of them. But say you read the directory and you say, you know, I, I, there's four or five of them that I could see myself in, being interested in. I'd like to learn more about those five. You can get those five different info reports and learn more about them. And they they get into pricing, they get into demographics, they get into a lot of resources where if you want to learn the craft or who are the suppliers, who are the, uh, the industries or the associations or all of the things related, you know, what are the magazines or the trades? Uh, it gets into all of that. Are there, do they have annual conventions and things like that? And, and that's where we get a little deeper. And then I also do provide uh, coaching and consulting uh, both uh, in live seminars as well as one-on-one -on -one individual coaching 
where it's all based on the foundational elements. If somebody says, I want to be a magician and I also want to learn to juggle and I, I, I would like to do kids parties, but I'd also like to, to get into to, uh, fairs and festivals and maybe do some corporate work. Then we take those four or five outlines and we create a profile of, of what you want, where you're located, your geographical area. And then we one-on-one based on your exact needs. It's kind of like customized uh, coaching that we do. And uh, it kind of fast tracks thing, you know, because there's not a lot available on entertainment, most people get into it and it's trial and error. And there's a lot of bumps and setbacks and, you know, you spend a little more money than you need to kind of learning lessons the hard way. And this kind of streams, streamlines all that. I've had people that have, uh, bought the books and the, the training and have uh, been out there, you know, earning money within a month or two. And uh, of course, it's an ongoing process, but it's something that we do offer. I, I offer myself and uh, my team that uh, works very well. And a lot of times now we go around to conferences and we speak and we uh, different kinds of entertainment conventions and we talk about the business side of things because there's just not a lot out there. And we're kind of getting known now as the authority on entertainment business, which I'm very proud of. That's very cool, Robin. And as I understand it, of course, you don't need a license. You don't need a degree. You really just need some connections and uh, how to find them and how to get started. Is, is that right? It's, it's kind yeah, of that you know, simple, huh? Having the right tools and the right guidance, I think, are important. And one of the things, I get a lot of people that do this right out of high school. I get some uh, college students that, that this is how they put themselves through college. You know, they because the college is a good market. There's always parties going on or, or, or a lot of uh, uh, nightclubs and things like that in college towns that are, are great, you know, for uh, some of our business opportunities. So uh, that's really what it is. You know, I, I am trying to, through this, I remember certain people saying to me, um, there'll come a time where people will ask you these questions and be sure you share with them and, you know, help create the next generation of, of uh, performers and, and now entertainment businesses. And I think that's what I'm doing. It's, it's a way for me to give back, and it's a way for me to uh, help other people out in their quest at the same time. And it's still something, I got to tell you, it's still something that I enjoy, both sides of it, the performing and the behind the scenes, as much today as I did when I started out. That's very cool, Robin. And, you know, you just touched lightly upon the next question I was uh, wanting to ask you, which is, Around this time of my show, I like talking about purpose, and I like to see what motivates you know my guests. And I like to know, Robin, what do you want to change in the world? What drives you to keep on? Well, I have been very fortunate in this journey to um, be part of the ground level of certain things, and, and, and some people have actually given me credit of pioneering things. The whole mobile disc jockey movement and boom in the 80s. I, I was part of that in the very early part of things. The comedy club boom in the uh, later 80s, I was part of, of course, celebrity appearances at shopping malls and things like that with the soap opera stars. And then I went to sports car, uh, sports stars. And right when the sports memorabilia boom happened and, and uh, there's other fringe things, when the Beanie Babies started, we were the ones that uh, started doing Beanie Baby collectible shows. So, so the, the point is, is the, um, I always like to keep it fresh. But, you know, my purpose was initially to do something I enjoyed. If I had to work for 40 or 50 or 60 years, I wanted it to be something I could enjoy. And then this world of, uh, it was bigger than I imagined. And I learned from people that took the time to share with me. And so that's one of my purposes now is, is sharing and training others on uh, what I've learned uh, from a lifetime in it. And also what it is within the industry. A lot of people go off of their gut feeling, oh, this is what, what I think I like, or this is what entertainment is to me. But you, I follow trends. I, I teach trends. I stay up on it. I think we always have to keep evolving. So to me, um, it's the self-fulfillment of doing something you love and enjoy. It's, it's sharing this with other people because for the longest time, a lot of the things that I teach and coach and train we're like closely guarded industry secrets. People didn't share. And that's why I'm so grateful that my mentors did with me. And they, although they didn't give me everything, a lot of it I had to piece together from a, a lot of different sources and s- figure some out myself. I, I like that, uh, that, that possibility. So that's what kind of drives me as well is, is to uh, help others and to share with others. And to, uh, I didn't think I would like that part of things as much as I do. And, uh, 
that that makes it kind of rewarding and fulfilling as well. So it's uh, and to me that's that, I guess that's part of my purpose now is to bring that same sense of accomplishment, pride, and and self control that uh, I've been able to do to others. Very cool, Robin. Well, thank you very much for sharing that and your passion and your enthusiasm for this industry really comes through. And I can see that you're on fire with that, your purpose. So that's very cool. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, it's one of those things that if people come up to me and talk about it, I could talk all day. So it's like, <laughs> ask me, you know, I, I tell people that it, it's not a quick answer. It's a, it's a process, but, and that's what I'm finding is when people get into this, they're realizing, wow, this is more fun and this is more opportunity than I thought. And they kind of get a thirst for wanting to know more, you know? Yeah. I mean, making money, making your living, earning a good living, surviving in this world and having fun. I mean, you can have it all. That's, that's what it's all about. It is. It's being happy and fulfilled and uh, doing something you enjoy and, and, uh, you know, enjoying your time while you're here. Exactly. Well, you know, we're close to wrapping up. We still got a little time. Is there anything else you'd like our audience to know about or make sure that, you know, you impart to us, please? I think the only other thing is, is this can be done anywhere and it can almost be done by uh, anyone. I, I have, like I said, uh, high school and college kids that do this. I have single parents. Uh, a lot of entertainers do this uh, while they have a full-time job and it's a great release. It can be a hobby that becomes a profitable uh, thing for you. Uh, there's some senior citizens I know that, uh, you know, they've worked their careers, they've retired and they don't, they don't want to just sit around and get old. So it's like, Oh, what, what, what can I do? And, you know, I've, I've got, uh, I've got people that, uh, you know, perform at senior centers and nursing homes and, uh, some people that help Santa around the holidays. And, uh, there's so many different opportunities that, uh, it literally can be for anyone, uh, couples, I did a survey of, of uh, some people that we've worked with over the years and, you know, what did you get most about it, out of it or what did you enjoy the most or what, what kind of drove you? And, you know, one of the things that I hadn't even factored on was uh, a lot of, uh, you know, people said, oh, of course, the, the great income potential, the fact that uh, it doesn't intrude with work. You know, most people work nine to five and most of entertainment is on the evening and the weekends. If somebody wants to do it full time, there are some daytime markets like, uh, libraries and daycares and school market. But uh, the one thing that people responded to in, a, in this survey was the fact that they like doing it with their partner, be it you know two guys or two ladies as business partners, or uh, a husband and wife team that are looking for something to do. You know, And uh, I think the main thing is once they realize that it is an opportunity, they start you know looking at, oh, wow, there's so many different dynamics that are to this that... Uh, you kind of pick and choose what you enjoy or what appeals to you. And uh, it can be as much or it can be as little as uh, people want. Again, you don't have to be the talent. You can just be the owner operator because there are many entertainers out there that are looking for more bookings or that uh, don't want to do the business side and would rather trust that to someone else. You know, like I say, I, all of the you know different magazines from time to time, whether it's small business op- entrepreneur, work at home, be your own boss. All these kind of magazines have also, you know, identified different entertainment opportunities among the, you know, the the best startups too. So I think it's it's just, uh, you know, take some time and uh, give it a look. Uh, what I do have too for your listeners, if they go to our website, uh, entertainmentopportunities.com, I have a free report that they can get uh, to learn a little bit more about this. And we've got a couple of stories in there from uh, people that have been successful with this. And all they got to do is uh, put in. Uh, the name of your show, Revenue Chat, or, or your name, either one, and uh, uh, get the free report. And it really uh, kind of is the first step to learning more about this. And and I don't want anybody doing it that's that's not happy or, or not doing it for the right reason. So I, I, I this is a way to to get familiar with uh, more familiar with the the directory and uh, get some insight as well. And it's absolutely free. Well, that's very cool. And thanks, Robin. I will be sure to uh, put that somewhere in the show notes or put some links up on that. And as I understand it, a person does not need, so just a little short, teensy-weensy little recap, you don't need to be an entertainer, sing songs, play the guitar, be a clown, or be a magician. You could book the shows for those people. And that means with just a little ramp-up time, I'm going to say, can I say conservatively, within probably a couple of weeks, a person could start making some additional income by just booking the talent for already for the industries that already want and are searching for such talent. 
Exactly. You know, a, a lot of it, a lot of people may know people already. You know, it might be where their husband works or where they, where they work or a local bar that they, they frequent. And, uh, you know, you can kind of become the matchmaker and, and, and say, geez, you know, I'm, uh, you know, this is what I want to specialize in. You become very quickly, you kind of become the expert in your entertainment scene in your area and you become the go-to person for a lot of people. So initially you might want to go out and start making some contacts or putting the feelers out there or putting up some business cards, but eventually this comes back to you, you know, and and then out of every, there's a snowball effect that happens too. You know, you book a couple of shows and say there's 80 people at a show and they have a good time, then they'll come up to you and say, can I have your card? I'd like to book you for an event. And oh my goodness, it can take off and it doesn't take a lot. It just, uh, it just takes the uh, initial steps and the, the, you know, we kind of lay out the, the process for you and then uh, it can happen that quickly. I love it. And that's just literally all part-time income that does not impede on the regular job or profession or career of the person. And it's just additional income. So it's almost like nothing really to lose, just a little time to put these deals, contracts, entertainment opportunities together. And voila, presto, like, is it a magic deck? You have business. <laughs> and, well, and we have, we have uh, what we call the Entertainer's Business Toolkit, which has all the forms and contracts and invoices and everything you need as well. So we make it very easy for you. But uh, it's all, it's, you know, I say what you're doing is you're, invest, you're investing in the knowledge and the education. And then once you get that and you see how simple it is or how, how you can do that in your area, it's, uh, people get excited about it. And, they, you know, they're, they're, they're usually more excited to jump into it. And I might say, well, let's make sure you have this understood first. And, and they're, they're, they get results right away. So. Well, very cool. Well, Robin, I want to thank you very, very much. It's truly an honor to have someone of your stature on my show, and I learned a lot. And by the way, you mentioned the monkeys. It's just coincidentally, they're showing up at the Grove across the street from my place in October. And I was like, what a small world. <laughs> I've known the monkeys for years. Uh, Davey was a good friend of mine. Oh, my. And, um, you know, for a long time, it was him, Mickey, and Peter that toured. And now that Davey's gone, Mike has kind of rejoined them. And, uh, you know, you talk about there's a couple of bands out there the Beach Boys, the Monkeys. You can go to with your whole family and have a great time. And, and of course, the Grove is such a great venue. But, uh, uh, yeah, highly suggest it. Go out there and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, it's funny. They have some some geriatric jokes in there now, too. Oh, so bet. <laughs> they cover the whole camera. <laughs> well, very cool. Well, listen, Robin, it was great. I want to thank you. And once again, everyone, his website is entertainmentopportunities.com. Well, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. And stay tuned to our next show on Revenue Chat. Listen to my other awesome interviews at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash radio and please drop me a message i'd love to hear from you all right thanks again everyone and until next time remember you can make life better for yourself and everyone choose wisely 